uh, this is the RCU uh, Bird of Feather session, RCU office hours. Uh, this is mostly for you guys to ask questions and uh, me to see what I can do about getting answers. Um, if uh, nobody has questions, I've got a presentation I go through just kind of talks about RCU. But let's start with asking questions first, both uh, online and, and here. And here Will there be a stream of the RCU box? Uh, I believe there will, but I'll leave that, leave that aside. Come on, somebody's got to be brave here. And if not, I'm going to go through a boring presentation. Uh, I have a dumb question. All right, I've got a dumb answer for you then. What, what, like how long is too long for an RCU read section? Um, how long is too long for an RCU read section? That's a good question. And it depends uh, to some extent on the, on the setup. So if you have larger systems, and larger can be more CPUs, it can be more tasks, uh, you will often have uh, more uh, longer RC readers just because you have a longer task list to scan, you got more CPUs, you go that kind of thing. But it's uh, as a rough rule of thumb, if you'd be uncomfortable holding a reader writer lock reader, the read side of reader writer lock for more than a certain length of time, you probably should start feeling uncomfortable being RC for that length of time. Although RC is a little more forgiving. If you hang on for, so now, it also depends on your platform. Um, there are, Android people are doing some things where they want expedited grace periods in under 20 milliseconds. And they prefer it to be like this many milliseconds, as near as I can tell. Uh, obviously, if you have a reader that's longer than a millisecond, you don't get a grace period, even an expedited one less than a millisecond, right? But the, they're talking about smaller devices like this one. So they have very few CPUs by server standards, and uh, they're not going to be running that many tasks. Uh, so, uh, and we've had problems with that. Uh, I was stupid enough to think that I could say config Android and it'd be for Android devices. And it turns out that every distro in the world turns that on, <laughs> unknowns to me. And so when, once we got that in, we got in the thing for if you were an Android, it would complain if you had an expedited grace period that ran for longer than a few milliseconds. People just started triggering that all over the place. It's like, that's not an Android. What are you doing? Why do you have to trigger Android enabled? Well, what's enabled? Uh, anyway, uh, Christoph took care of that problem, Christoph Helway. Uh, he just removed config Android entirely. Uh, and so the way it works now is that the there's separate uh, uh, stall durations. And the default for both of them in mainline is 21 seconds, right? And if you're running an Android, you'll want to, and you care about extra grace grids, uh, you'll want to set it down. It's in milliseconds. So you can set it to 20 or 10 or whatever you want. All right. So um, to kind of sum back up, uh, on larger systems, the readers will be longer. If you hold one for longer than 21 seconds, that's a foul. It'll yell at you. Okay. Uh, longer than five seconds, there can be other things that get yelled at a little bit. All right. Um, Longer than two milliseconds, or two seconds, excuse me, you can get, actually get a lockup warnings as well. And uh, if you're on an Android, longer than a few milliseconds is considered bad. Which comes back to, if you're doing something that is independent of the size of the system, uh, you really want to be down in the hundreds of microseconds um, because of the Android thing, which is also true of your Rider Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, very good, good question. I'm camera low. Okay. Uh, any other ones? Uh, other? So there was a talk yesterday about uh, like how to make RCU do that. Oh yeah, that was uh, uh, Joel Fernandez and uh, yeah, like, uh, yeah. I, I didn't get a chance to do that one. Uh, the one. Okay. Take on that one. Is it good or is it like? Uh, um, it's uh, it's actually pretty interesting. Uh, Thomas doesn't like it, but you know Thomas doesn't like anything, so there you are. Uh, <laughs> he's almost as bad as I am that way. Anyway, um, what the deal is, is that uh, on uh, Android and Chromebooks, uh, so the people that were presenting it were, you know, Joel's from Chromebook, um, Vlad is from uh, Android, um, Kadam is uh, Intel, so maybe he's both, I'm not sure. Uh, I think he's Android, but I'm not sure. Uh, I just spent him too much time today. Anyway, um, what happened was that I removed this thing called RCU Fast No Hertz. 
right? RCU Fastenal Hertz went in the kernel about 10 years ago. And it was there because people were complaining about servers um, going non-idle. You know, RCU would be would keeping the schedule clock interrupt on for a while. And the embedded guys were especially annoyed by this. In fact, uh, the thing that started off was uh, somebody was really torqued off because RCU scheduling clock interrupts, little scheduling clock interrupts that RCU was kind of making happen just to kind of run the state machine through, get the callbacks all actually get things cleaned up, and then we go idle. What's the problem, right? I'm a server guy. This is great, right? Well, for the for some battery powered guys, it was consuming between 30 and 40 percent of their battery, just these little few scheduling clock interrupts. They were not happy. They were so not happy that it did not suffice to flame me on Linux kernel mail list. They called me on the phone and yelled at me, all right? <laughs> These guys are serious. You know, it's a, us service guys at the time had uh, energy efficiency as a first class requirement. As near as I can tell, those guys had it as a fundamentalist religion, all right? Anyway, so I, uh, I did the fast networks as a response to that. And the idea was that uh, if you had a CPU that was going to go idle and had callbacks, the idea was to was to try to get those callbacks taken care of quickly so go to idle more quickly. It turned out that burned more power than it saved. And I ended up rewriting that like eight or nine times before I got something that actually saved power uh, on real hardware with real power measurements. We had a, 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 a Robert and Howe, uh, Dittmer Eggman and I, and there may be a fourth person I'm forgetting, wrote a paper on it uh, for a real-time conference back in uh, about 10 years ago. So that worked fine. What ended up eventually happening is that if it, it would, instead of turning the tick on, it would say, all right, start the tick up in uh, four jiffies. So it would decrease the number of ticks by a factor of four. So that's where you are savings from. And we had the concept of a lazy callback, which was one that came from, uh, unlike uh, the, the current proposal, which is having an actual call RCU lazy, uh, that those came from K3RCU. All right, and so if all your callbacks are K-free RCU, it would wait like six seconds before it would wake up and see did something happen. The other piece of that is that we numbered the grace periods. So that meant you could kind of stamp each set of group of callbacks with which grace period they went with. So if you woke up six seconds later and there are 15 grace periods, you say, great, every last time you care has been taken care of. Grab all the lists, squish them together, and set them up so they can be invoked later. Whereas before that, it would just kind of, you know, a grace period happen, advance them one. Um, and if five grace period happens, it would still advance the one, which was a problem. So that was kind of what got to that point. Uh, however, a couple of years ago, I noticed that the only people in enabling that were also offloading callbacks. Come on in, have a seat. Uh, you know, we're talking about energy efficiency and, uh, and uh, the, as you should be. <laughs> come on, there's more to life than energy efficiency. <laughs> um, as I was talking about the fundamentalist really, oh, sorry, uh, the uh, uh, energy efficiency and uh, servers versus uh, embedded. Anyway, uh, I noticed that all the people that had that enabled were also offloading callbacks. In other words, they would have a uh, config RC fast enough it's set, but they would also have every CPU included in the RCU no CDs boot parameter. And the, and the, what happens is if the, if the callbacks are offloaded, well, the CPU says, yeah, they're callbacks, but that's the that key thread over there's problem. They're not my problem. We just go to sleep immediately. And so what was happening is that everybody was just adding an extra check to their idle path. And I was like, I was asking around for like two years. Come on in, have a seat. Uh, for like two years. And everybody that enabled fast enough hertz was in that situation where it was doing nothing but hurting them. So I removed it. Okay. Straightforward. That'll save a few cycles of going into idle and less complexity, less confusion, less code for me to maintain. That's a good thing. At about that time, uh, the Intel guys were realized that they had these. Uh, I can't remember whether they're using Androids or Chromebooks, but they had figured out that fast enough would help them if they didn't offload the callbacks. Uh, so most of the Chrome Chrome OS guys in Intel. Uh, so they got upset at me for removing it. And I'd say, well, try offloading, and they did that, and it helped a lot. Um, but they wanted more. Uh, and uh, so I said, fine, you can slow down the grace sprints. They tried that, and that was great, except it slowed down their boot speed, which people didn't like. I'm not sure why. Um, and it also slowed down some other uh, UI interaction things and some tracing things that they also didn't like. 
anyway, so we went back and forth, and uh, uh, Joel and Karam and uh, and Vlad uh, Niraj Upadhyay is, was involved as well. Uh, and there are a couple of the people whose names I'm sorry I forgot. Uh, I'll remember them at 3 a.m. this uh, this coming morning, and that'll be useless. Uh, and what they found was that uh, there were only a few callbacks that would show up. And there was a, uh, as was mentioned, there was a referee track presentation yesterday. There was also a piece of the CPU isolation microconference that touched on this uh, just before break. And uh, what the problem was, they slowed everything down. They had all these side effects. But if you had a, a device that was idle, for example, maybe just playing back a movie and doing nothing else, what would happen is that it would kind of wake up, open a file, and close it, go to sleep. Wake up, open a file, close it, go to sleep. My immediate feedback was, well, leave the stupid file open for crying out loud. Because what happens, every time you close a file, it sets up an RC callback. Because you've got a multi-threaded process that closed the file. There might be some other thread that's going to try to come in just at that time and mess with that file descriptor. Um, and so it has to hand it to RCU to make sure that that thing sees, oh, it's been closed now, so forget it. It wasn't really there. But avoid a use after free error that would otherwise happen if it didn't use RCU, right? Um, anyway, a lot of people thought that was convincing, uh, and actually including Thomas Leitzer in the in the session just before break. Uh, but the guys actually writing the application, despite being beat on from several different directions, couldn't be convinced. They really wanted to close that stupid file. I don't know why. Anyway, so um, what the, what they did was they made a call RCU lazy. And what that does, um, and this only has effect if you have callbacks offloaded. If you have callbacks offloaded, the queuing is kind of complex. And the reason is, if, if, you're, if you're not offloaded, you're queuing yourself, and it's, it's a soft IR queue. So you just disable interrupts or disable BH, as the case may be. You throw them on a list. You're the only one touching it, and life is easy. If you're handing them off, you're offloading them. You're handing some other K thread up. Well, guess what? You got locking. You got atomics. You got memory ring. You got the whole mess landing on your head. Um, and uh, we use the same queue structure between them. But the problem is, is that if you have a callback flood where some crazy person is doing an RMDOX RF, that's actually kind of normal. There's some other things you can do in user space that make callbacks happen really, really fast. Okay. Uh, RCU is able to keep up with them as far as I know. Uh, there was a time a couple of years ago where it couldn't under some circumstances. And I did a bunch of fixes that helped with that. So hopefully we're good. But nevertheless, if you go and you dump, uh, you know, there's places you can dump a million callbacks per second down RCU's throat for one CPU, no problem. And RCU has to keep up. And if you if you have some shared data structure, you're touching that often between two different CPUs, the K-thread running on one CPU and the other CPU doing its callbacks, you've got lock contention problems. So we have to have a, a kind of a pre-queue. Um, and so if it detects that there's a lot of callbacks happening, it just dumps them in this pre-queue for a while and every so often flushes them to main queue. The idea being just to reduce the number of lock acquisitions on the main queue from the CPU that's generating the callbacks. Because, you know, it takes a few milliseconds to get race period done anyway. So it's not like, you know, it's not like waiting a few hundred microseconds uh, if you have a whole pile of callbacks that's in the next batch and is going to make any difference whatsoever. You just have to make sure that you've got a constant flow of work. All right. And because of that, what that means is that we can easily do a lazy in that situation. What would happen normally is you throw, you realize you're overloaded, so you throw a callback in there. Um, you know that you're going to be woken up because there's you got a pile of callbacks. The reason you're doing it is you got a pile of callbacks down here already. And so if you if you do lazy, all you really have to do, well, uh, I'm lying a little bit, okay, but all you have to do is to change the timeout. So instead of fairly quickly, within you know a millisecond or so, dumping the callbacks down, 15 seconds will be fine because this is something that's just going to free up a file descriptor thing, and who cares? It's a little slow. Um, if a, if a non-lazy callback shows up, that automatically makes everything else non-lazy. I mean, if you go through a grace period anyway, why not take care of all the callbacks? All right. Uh, there's, there's, you know, the point of it was to reduce wake-ups. And so you had to do a wake-up anyway because you got somebody that's urgent coming down. Maybe it's a, a synchronized RCU where there's an actual task that might do be something important that's locked on it. Just, blow them all through and go back to normal processing. Anyway, they found that got them 2% uh, uh, energy efficiency savings on Android and like 10% or something like that on Chrome OS, on top of uh, like between 30 and 40% just for going to uh, offloading. 
all right? And the reason the offloading helps is because then the scheduler can decide where to put the, where and when to execute the uh, callbacks. Whereas if it's not offloaded, it's a software queue and software queue is like now, you know, uh, and there's no point at now. It's, it's nice for servers because it's much more efficient. You're burning less CPU per callback. Um, although it might be interesting to experiment with offloading on servers. Uh, Rick Van Reel, back about 2010, I was trying to make it all off offload in 2010. Rick Van Reel ran some benchmark that got some horrible performance uh, degradation because the context switches were killing it. Anyway, that's kind of a, that's kind of how we got there on it. Um, and so uh, the, that approach looks fairly good to me. The downside of it is that you have to mark things as lazy. You have to actually take a callback and say, this one's lazy. And uh, it might be just fine for it to be lazy when Android is idle and Chrome OS are almost idle. Is it really okay in all circumstances, all machines in all cases for it to be lazy? Well, okay, on servers, um, since you're not offloading, there's no laziness. I mean, you say call RCU lazy, but it just does the same thing that call RCU did and you don't have to worry. Um, but um, uh, if you are offloading, which a number of workloads do, in addition to Android and Chrome OS, real-time workloads tend to do this, and uh, they might uh, they might uh, have a difference of opinion as to whether a given class of callbacks is okay to kind of defer for 15 seconds. For example, if you're if you're shorter on memory than a typical Android device would be, would be one reason. But yeah, let's see what happens, right? So, good question. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's uh, kind of interesting, it kind of goes back and forth whether RCU's requirements are being driven most heavily by uh, deep embedded or by uh, Android style embedded or by high end servers or by whatever it is. But right now it looks like it's energy efficiency for the moment anyway. A question in the chat. Okay, why don't you read it off for me? I can't really see very well back there. Alan W says, when is slab type safe by RCU the right choice? When is slab type safe by RCU the right choice? Uh, rarely is uh, the high level answer. Uh, that's an excellent question because that's a that's an interesting approach. One of the things that can, bad things that happen to you when you switch to RCU. So what happens if you aren't using RCU? You do a free, okay, K free, and that thing's just right there on the list. And you can do a K malloc, and bam, you get it back. It's hot in the cache, and you know wipe is good. If you RCU free it, well, you get yourself out of a whole bunch of races, and that's good. But the way you get out of it is it kind of goes off and sits for a while and gets cash cold and then gets put on the free list. So you came out and you get this cash cold thing. Most of the time, that's not a big deal. Uh, typically, you use RCU in a place where you're read intensive, and so the updates aren't happening often, so that cash coldness is down on the noise. But Murphy being who it is, who he is, there's always exceptions, all right? And if you look at cache type safe by RCU, you find that in the kernel, you can find some of the exceptions. So what cache type safe by RCU allows you to do is it allows it, so when you do the, you just do an immediate free into your slab that's been built with slab type safe by RCU, and it can be immediately reallocated, it's hot in the cache, life is good, all right? But what happens is if you have an RCU reader that logs onto that thing just before it's freed, they still have hold of it when it's allocated. Now the saving grace is that it's the same type. It's the same struct type, right? Um, before a page of those things, if, if they're all empty, it could be recycled back to the system and made something else, but it's gonna do an RC weight on that. But that's the uncommon case. The common case here is putting objects back and forth into a slab and freeing up a slab and actually giving the whole thing back is rare. That's gonna be cash cold, but okay, whatever, right? Now, what that means is the thing you look up might not be what you expect. And so you have to have a protocol for dealing with that. I'm gonna describe it verbally. Um, and uh, um, there's a really excellent comment above the pound sign defined slab type safe by RCU. So I'm gonna describe that uh, verbally. If you're interested in it, you should really look at that comment and take that to heart, okay? There are some other things you can do, but that's the one that makes the most sense. Now, um, you'd like to just be able to grab a lock, but um, the problem is 
that uh, the slab system doesn't zero the pages, the new pages, right? So yeah, if you allocate something that was just recently freed, it's going to have the same state as when it was free. But if you happen, if it happens, there's nothing there, so it has to give you a whole new page. That page has got garbage in it, and so you don't get to, you know, uh, you you don't get to uh, acquire a lock on garbage. Uh, the problem is that the guy who allocated the thing before he gives it to the readers, he has to initialize it. He has to initialize it. All right, and uh, so the way you make that work is that you'll have a, a reference count on it. And the guy initializing it, he's allocated a new one, he initializes, he sets it to zero, all right? Um, or, excuse me, he sets it to one. And then he makes it available. Now, a reader, what the reader does is he goes in, he gets the reference to it, and the first thing he does is he does a, 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 an ink not zero on that reference counter. If the value is zero, well, that means it's just been freed and you, you found something that you didn't find. So just pretend you didn't find it and try again, or just say failed, depending on what your algorithm is. If you do get the reference count, then it's stable. It can't be freed anymore. And now you can acquire a lock on it if you need a lock. All right. And the reason, again, the, the poor guy doing the, the, the uh, came and struck Alec, if there's a lock, he's going to have to do a spin lock and end on that stupid thing every time. So if you acquire a lock on something that's just being freed, boom, you know, your, your lock just got destroyed. And uh, uh, it's no fun acquiring a lock on something that's being spin lock and knitted at the same time. Uh, that, that is not good for the lifespan of your kernel. So again, what you need to do is you need to have a reference count. The guy doing the Cayman struct alloc needs to set that reference count to one. People that are doing read side acquisitions of it need to do an ink not zero on it. If that fails, let go of it, either fail or retry or whatever you're going to do. If it succeeds, you actually have the object. Now you check to make sure it's the one you thought you wanted. So maybe there's a key you recheck. Okay. Um, and then if it's, if it's the one you wanted, you say, great. If it's not the one you wanted, you release your reference count. Um, you may also at that point have to came and slab free it if you're the last reference. Right. Um, as you know, the usual reference counts. And then, the, and then if you come to the point where you're the guy removing it, you unlink it from the list, you drop the initial reference, and if you had a reference as well, you have to release that one too, all right? At that point, it might be zero. If it did come out zero, then you free it. Otherwise, whoever's holding the reference will actually free it on your behalf. So that's kind of the dance you play. It's obviously more complicated. You're having to do memory writes on a read-only object, all right? But um, when you free the thing and allocate things, in the common case, you're getting cache hot objects. And in some use cases, that is that is more than worth the effort. So that's kind of, that's the main use case. There are some other things you can you can do. You could do tricks with uh, sequence locking, kind of, but it's uh, not documented. So uh, uh, be careful if you try to innovate in that area, because it's really easy to shoot yourself on the foot <laughs> with that. Now, one question is, well, geez, why not zero those stupid slaps before we hand them out? Because then you know it was zero, and, and you could initialize a spin lock when you're first allocating, and, be, and you'd only do that if, you know, you check to see this field zero. Have it been initialized? If it's, if it's zero, you initialize the whole mess, including initialized spin locks. You throw it in there. People can just grab the thing and grab a lock, and then, uh, you know, when you free it, you leave the I'm initialized bit set so that when he, if he gets it back, he sees that bit set, he doesn't reinitialize spin lock, and life is golden, right? Uh, the problem with that is that the, in some cases, the overhead of zeroing the slap kills you. Okay, um, but there may be use cases where it's advantageous, in which case, presumably, we could add some new slab flag that made it so that you could make a pipe safe by RCU that worked that way and was easier to use, but zeroes the slab each time you grab a new slab. Did that uh, that cover things on uh, uh, who was this here? Alan, Alan W. Okay, that's a fun one. Um, I remember when I first looked at it, I was confused thinking it did zero at each time, and I was I had some difficulty understanding what was going on, but uh, there you have it. Other questions? A 
Well, one one thing that's uh, I'm going to point out as a public service message. Uh, if you guys are LSFM and you already heard this, I may go through the slides and find it to go through it. Uh, one of the things that happened about uh, three or four years ago was that uh, MC was that RCU got involved in its first uh, uh, exploitable security issue. Uh, and then it wasn't RCU's fault in some sense because uh, back then there were three flavors of the main RCU. You had one that was uh, a parental RCU, you could have uh, a a preemption based RCU, RCU SCED, and there was a bottom half RCU. And they were independent. So that meant if you're using readers on one, you had to use the update. So if you used RCU, RCU Readlock VH, you'd better use synchronized RCU VH. All right, otherwise, no guarantees. Some poor guy somewhere got that, got confused, and he did an RCU Readlock, and he did an, uh, and, and a synchronized RCU VH, and, and uh, life was hard. Anyway, they fixed that. It was they figured it out pretty quickly and fixed it. But Linus uh, sent me an email say, "Paul, can we make this not happen again?" And so what I did was I consolidated the, the three flavors. So you had the different readers, but you used to synchronize RCU and it waits for all of them. So that means you can't mismatch because there's nothing to mismatch. However, it means you got to be a little careful with backporting past uh, 419 and 420, which which when the change went in. Because if you have a, a 5.0, say, synchronized RCU, that waits for everything. If you just take that and backport that straight to, uh, say, uh, 4.14, uh, sorry, no, okay? Now, uh, there's an easy way to get around that, uh, and that is there's something in the older releases called synchronized RCU mult, and you put the call RCU thing uses arguments to it. So if you said uh, synchronized RCU mult, mult open paren, Call RCU, comma, call RCU, BH, comma, call RCU, SCED, close parent, semicolon, it would wait for all three grace periods in parallel. All right, so there's a simple translation. Uh, but the price for getting rid of the security hole um, for new code is that we have a security hole for backports. So, you know, hopefully the security hole for backports will grow old and be irrelevant after a while. Uh, but if, you have, if you're dealing with a kernel that's uh, uh, 419 or earlier, please be careful backporting. And how did the exploit take advantage of that? Um, you know, if you're minding your own business and you get an email from Linus and it it uh, CCs the schedule li the, the security list but doesn't CC LKML, um, you're probably not going to be minding your own business for a while. Uh, I never did find out exactly what the exploit was. I don't think I'm cleared to know. Yeah. And I'm actually quite happy not to be cleared to know that kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> but you, you can imagine how it would happen. They would they would, uh, the thing is it could free something too quickly. It could be reallocated to something else. And then somebody could overwrite something that affected some poor reader that was still ac uh, accessing it. They claimed that somebody had actually created an exploit. Um, it's used after free basically, right? Exactly, exactly. I have a question. Uh, yeah. Is there a performance uh, penalty to waiting for all types, all modes of grace periods? So the question is, uh, is there a penalty to waiting for all types of grace periods? Oh, there's a little bit because you have a little bit extra space on your stack. You're gonna have to have, what it's gonna do is it's going to, when you do those call RCUs, it makes an array that it puts on the stack that has an RCU head for each flavor you call out. And then it's going to do a call RCU, whichever it's gonna call the functions you did, but it's gonna do them in fairly quick succession. In terms of latency, you'll wait for the longest of them. I mean, you'll have a little bit of extra thing because you're going to have to have a, a reference count that's going to have to decrement it, but that's going to be in the noise latency. You have, you're going to have more CPU because you have all three things, but you're going to have to wait for all three of them anyway if that was semantically what was required back in the uh, older code, right? Um, I guess the more likely situation is you'd have new code that took advantage of the fact that it could take all three of them, and you're backporting that whole thing. Um, then it's going to be a performance disadvantage compared to the newer kernels. But to make that happen in an older kernel, you would still have to wait for all three. All right. So that is something to be aware of. There might be something that gives you a performance advantage on a new compute on a new kernel. You backport the fourth fourth thing, you end up having to wait for three grace periods concurrently, and that might burn up CPU to offset the advantage. So that's another thing to be careful of. So good question. Good questions all so far. There's some other things, I guess, that are coming up. Um, uh, 
uh, let me uh, kind of go forward to them. This is, let's see here, let me see if I've got my mouse in the right place. Maybe. All right, I'm clearly, oh, I'm backwards and I can't unbackwards myself. Well, there's always the approach of coming around here and doing it this way so that my reflexes work. I think if I do that, all right. But do you want to show that? Go to the three dots. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to get the mouse, the focus set up so that it would, uh, but thank you, so that it would actually do that. Okay, so we've gone through this. Um, okay. Uh, can people, if now we can't see the, uh, can somebody else please pop open, uh, uh, pop open uh, BBB and, and please, if somebody's doing yelling out, because uh, if we have it like there, you guys can't see it. Um, and uh, uh, it's a little better. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, yeah, you know, you know that by my talking so far. Uh, anyway, uh, let's take some votes. I could go through a quick, here's kind of how RCU works and how to think about it. How many people would like to see that? Oh, we got at least one. Okay. Okay, well, we'll take a look through it. Uh, so this is the RCU review. We're, we're going to kind of go through quickly. There are some, uh, a couple of uh, uh, presentations in the URLs on the bottom there. I believe you can download this thing from the, from the thing, at least you do so right now. Uh, when we close the room, it might disappear. Uh, they go through this in much more detail. But we don't have three hours, so we'll go through it quickly. So the point of this, what, what's the point of our seal? The thing is, is that there's this rather um, inconvenient thing called the finite speed of light, and another inconvenient thing called non-zero size of atoms. Now, when I was a kid, I understood that uh, a slow speed of light was inconvenient, but I was thinking in terms of interstellar travel and things like that. It never occurred to me that I'd be having to deal with it in little boxes this size, that the speed of light is something this big could possibly be a problem, but here I am, okay? It is. So what that means is that things like locks, where everybody has to agree, yes, we're reading now, and so we can have a bunch of readers. Yes, we're gonna do a write. So everybody, no, no readers anymore, now writers. Those transitions are expensive because the speed of light is only so fast, and uh, it's not just the speed of light. Um, the speed of light in a vacuum is slow enough. Uh, try the speed of electric waves in silicon. It's like 3% of the speed. So that's a nanosecond at uh, vacuum, except that you're always saying, give me some information and getting it back. So that's half of that. And if you go and do the other stuff and look at the trend inside of a piece of silicon, you're about this big over and back. Chips are about this big. Now there's a, a trend to kind of stack things on top and take the third dimension, which could reduce the size of the chip, but reducing it to this size uh, seems brave at this point. Maybe it'll happen. Um, there's been a lot of progress in that way, but nevertheless, it uh, looks like we have to deal with this for a while. So what we're gonna do is instead of relying strictly on time and saying at this time we have writers, okay, ending writers, okay, wait, 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 at this time we have readers again. What we're going to do is we're going to use both time and space, space being address space or space of values. There's actually a number of different definitions of space you can leverage. And RCU is one way to do this. Hazard pointer is another way. Actually, you can use reference counters this way too, except that they have uh, cache locality issues, but you can use them. Okay. So this is uh, uh, the, the core API. There's actually more than 100 API members. Uh, there's a, uh, a elevating article that uh, gets at it if you look for the RC, it's uh, in 2019. Uh, if you can't find it, send me an email, I'll send it to you. So we can begin and end a reader with RC read lock and RC read unlock. Um, those are useful names in some circumstances and totally confusing in others, and life's like that sometimes. You know, if uh, people didn't think of new ways to use this, uh, we could use a good set of names that covered everybody, but there's a lot of different use cases, and I can't, I can't think of a name that covers everybody, I'm sorry. Uh, synchronized RC we've seen, that waits for all pre-existing readers. You don't have to wait for new ones, just the old ones. So it's, that's the difference between between reader-writer locks. Reader-writer locks, you wait for the readers to get done and you block any other readers. Here, readers just keep coming, but you only wait for the old ones. Call RCU is just an asynchronous version of synchronized RCU. And these first four are dealing with time. Okay, so we have a reader start at a time and ends at a time. We started waiting for readers at some time. The readers we need to wait on 
get done in some time, uh, likewise for call RCU. RCU to reference loads an RCU protect pointer. And that, when it gets that pointer, that assigns space to that reader. Because that pointer might have been updated, another reader will get a different space, a different address space. All right. And we'll use that spatial difference later to make things work out. Uh, do reference protected is just uh, uh, allows you to lock, make locked F work for you. RCU dereference is going to insist you're in RCU read type critical section. With RCU dereference protected, you give it a lock and it just insists on that lock being held. There are some other variations on that, but that'll do. RCU assign pointer uh, is the update side. It's essentially a store release. It makes sure that uh, when you do an RCU dereference and then dereference the pointer later, uh, you're not going to see pre initialization garbage. Initialize the structure to an RCU assigned pointer. Anybody that reads that pointer is guaranteed to see your initialization. So it's just a, uh, essentially a, an acquire release thing, except uh, in the case of the acquire, using much lighter weight hardware primitives than an acquire would use on some platforms. Okay. So this is kind of showing the temporal relationship. Time is going from top to bottom. We've got four different scenarios. Time going top and bottom, each of those four. Uh, it's really ordering, but uh, uh, we don't have to worry about the difference in this lecture. And uh, other ones would. Um, okay, so we have a reader and an updater. So in the first case, in the upper left over there, we have an RC read lock that happened before the synchronized RC started. So we have the re RC read lock, we have a critical section, we have an RC read unlock. Now the critical section in this case might have access to something that got removed, because you can see the remove started after the critical section started. And that means that that synchronized RCU would better wait for that reader to get done before actually freeing stuff. And in this case, it does. Uh, so that reader runs, it does stuff, and it's guaranteed that the stuff it's using stays in existence for its full duration, right? Now, you can do it the other way around. That's the upper right over here. We remove, we start synchronized RCU. This RC read lock starts shortly afterwards, but it can't possibly have gotten access to the things that were removed. It happened too late. And this is why synchronized RC only has to wait for pre-existing readers, because only those pre-existing readers can possibly have access to the stuff that is going to be destroyed or repurposed or something after synchronized RC returns. So in this case, the fact that that reader persists beyond free gold memory is not an issue, because that reader can't possibly have access to the stuff that's being freed. The lower left is kind of the belt and suspenders approach because we started after the removal. Therefore, that reader, that little reader there, can't possibly have access to the stuff removed. And even if it did, it doesn't matter because it gets done before we do the freeing. So that's okay as well, obviously. We get the best of both. The thing that would be a bug in RCU if it happened is in the lower right. In this case, we could have a reader getting access to stuff that was removed and still be using it after it was being freed, and use after free is just as bad with RCU as it is anywhere else. And so RCU's job is to make this not happen, make that lower right scenario not happen. But this yeah. shows the vulnerability to the person who was using the wrong synchronized RCU there, right? Yeah, and so suddenly there's no no relation whatsoever between the readers and his updaters, and and so this could this could and did happen. Um, so you're right, it could be a usage bug in RCU back then. Oh, it could be now, too. You could use SRCU here, and you could use RCU there, and it still wouldn't work. So, yeah, it's uh, you, like any other synchronization primitive, you still have to be careful. We made it so you have to be a little bit less careful, but you still have to be careful. I'm sorry. You know, it's the nature of the beast. All right. So that's kind of a graphical view of how the temporal synchronization works. Um, and this is just kind of a quick reminder. Um, there, uh, RCU is a specialized tool. And so you kind of want to be using it where you read mostly and where it's okay to have stale and inconsistent data. It may sound like I don't want stale and inconsistent data ever, ever. But uh, in this case, the speed of light is actually working for us. If your computer is tracking the state of the outside world, the data is by definition always stale. It takes time for a change to make it for there to get to here. And if you're dealing with networking, since they have delays for stability, it could be tens of seconds or minutes before a routing change propagates off across a couple of continents and causes you to change which, which uh, interface you're sending the packet out, right? That's a fairly extreme example as things go, but 
um, security issue uh, protocols. So for example, uh, uh, audit or something like that. You change your audit rules. Well, there was some decision in some conference room, you know, a week or two ago where they said, we need to change this. And now you're finally applying to this computer. So you're using the old way for a few more milliseconds. Who cares? Now, if you do need uh, consistency, you're further down here and you can still apply it. It's just that it's going to be more complicated and less advantageous, perhaps. But uh, decache entries, the entries are right here in this yellow. And uh, it just so happens that the speed ups they get are enough to make the complexity worthwhile. Of course, it helps have a, somebody like Al Vero doing national work. Um, in the red area, if you need consistency and you're almost always updating, RC is almost never the right choice. Uh, the Linux kernel community, in fact, I said it was never the right choice uh, 20 years ago. The Linux community, kernel community decided to prove me wrong not once but twice. Uh, in certain real time workloads, the uh, real time properties of the readers may overwhelm you know you, so what we're using extra cpu on the update we don't care we want the readers to be fast in order to meet our our latency specifications and the other one comes back to the question we had earlier about slab type safe by rcu um, uh, you can end up with a situation where uh, the, the slab safe type safe by rcu also allows you to use certain um, lockless algorithms and a lot, of, a lot of lockless algorithms get bent out of shape if they free something and then it comes back around before they're ready for it. And so in the academic literature, they'll publish those and they'll say, use a garbage collector. And they'll publish them in Java or something like that. So their algorithms are simpler because if they try to handle the ABA problem, the stuff where they free something, it comes right back around and somebody doing a check to see if this gets this thing back and thinks it's the same when it's actually a different role, it'll get a little confused. You can use RCU to get the same effect. And so you'd use an RCU reader around the update, which may seem strange, but that's what you do. And then what happens is that uh, you go through, you do your replacement, and you're guaranteed that all the stuff that you looked at in this reader retains the same role, has the same, you know. And so then uh, you get the same simplifications you get with the garbage collector, but by using RCU readers. Anyway, so those are two ways the Linux kernel community proved me wrong about uh, never use the red area. So there you are. So the key point is, is specialize, uh, use it where it's, use the right tool for the job. And the other thing is, uh, there are exceptions to this as well, but RC is mostly used for linked data structures. And we're gonna be looking at, at it in that role as well. Okay, so we talked about the, uh, the latency. And so this red area, if we have a reader writer lock, you got a bunch of readers and eventually the updater decides he wants to do something. Well, he decides at some point, but he's gotta wait for the readers to get done. And he has to wait for the fact of the readers getting done to propagate across the system through the electronics. So that's your extra space there. Then the updater can run. Now we're blocking all the readers. We got a big hole in our throughput at this point, which sometimes that's okay, right? But sometimes it's not. And the bigger your system, the bigger the hole is because you're more CPUs making your hole up. The update gets done, it takes time for the fact of him being done to propagate out to the CPUs that want to read now. And so we'd like to be able to not have that big hole in throughput in some cases. Not always, but in some cases. And uh, RCU allows us to do that because, uh, because we're going to do the space thing. Now I mentioned earlier that uh, in RCU reference, I ran out of space, so let's dot, 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 think RCU reference something. Now this guy gets this thing, right? Because the pointer points here, the R shooter references, so he gets a reference to this object. The updater allocates something new, fills it in, he gets this guy now. And uh, he does a synchronized RCU. He has to wait for this guy to get done. This guy picks up the two fields, he gets consistent fields. He doesn't get like one from here and one from here. He gets these two guys because that's the pointer he got. So we have synchronization by time, we have synchronization by space. This reader that started later, after the assignment here um, is going to get this guy. Okay, he's going to get 39 and 44. But because he started later, the synchronized RCU doesn't have to wait for him. Okay, the old readers are in this space, the new readers are in this space. Since only this space is being being freed, the updater only has to wait for this space, this readers, the readers there before. Okay, and so we have time. We have kind of an uncertainty in time where a reader might get either of them, but he'll get one or the other, and he'll get a consistent view. 
And then beyond a certain time, we're always dealing with the new stuff. And because of that, what happens um, is, uh, I'm not sure why I have, maybe I just didn't hit it. Yeah, because of that, we can fill the readers in. So instead of having the gap, we have uh, readers on the left, they're always getting the old space. In the middle, they might get either, the kind of the funny greenish bluish color there. And then once everything settles out, they'll always get the new space. The updater is split into two. He allocated the stuff and he, and he did the switch. And then he had to wait, and a reader might have happened on him too because he's, he's blocked, some other task might run. And then he does the actual K3. And this means you can use the full throughput all the time. The difference is that you also don't have mutual exclusion. So you have to deal with the fact you may have different readers running at the same time having different views of the world. Some cases that's okay, other cases it's not. If it's not, uh, there are ways in RCU to kind of back out and, and make things work, uh, but I'm not gonna talk about those today. There's, uh, uh, I've done a bunch of, if you, if you need to do that, let me know. I can point you at a bunch of stuff to help get you started on. And this is gives you an idea of why um, this is uh, things on particular hardware. This is on a uh, uh, 192 CPU system, uh, two gigahertz Pentium. And uh, you can see that uh, this is log scale in both directions, number of threads on the bottom and uh, nanoseconds per operation going up. And so we're taking a better part of 10 microseconds for each read or writer lock read side operation on the large system. And with RC, we're staying fairly close to uh, sub, sub nanoseconds. And you're going, wait a minute, uh, that's less than the nanos less of a nanosecond than the clock cycles would allow. And the reason for that is that this is uh, using RC read lock and RC read lock on a non preemptible system. And so what you're seeing is a limitation of the compiler to be able to unroll the loop. All right. Um, now there's some fuzz as you get up farther, and that's because of hyperthreading. Uh, the loop can use more than half of a core. So if you ever run two hardware threads on the same core, you get less throughput. That's why it gets fuzzy out there. Anyway, that's uh, that's now of course this is an empty read side critical section. We say RC read lock, RC read unlock. We do read lock, read unlock. That's the best possible case for RCU. That's cheating in some sense. And as you can see, as you increase the critical section duration for up to 10 microseconds here, about 10 microseconds is not a whole lot of difference. There's some difference. This is the log scale, okay? So the difference between these two little things over here on the on the far right is significant, but it's still converging quickly as you increase the critical section. If you had a millisecond long critical section, who'd care? It wouldn't matter. But uh, the more CPUs you have and the longer the critical sections, or excuse me, the more CPUs you have and the shorter the critical sections, the greater the advantage RCU has over read or write or locking. So uh, the gentleman's question earlier, uh, he stepped out, how long should your critical sections be? If you have, if you're looking at read or write or lock, um, you can see that the more CPUs you have and the shorter your critical sections, the better, uh, the more important it is or the more benefit you'll get out of moving to RCU. So if you have long enough critical sections, maybe you should be using read or write lock instead. The critical sections are like a global property, right? They're not like just my um, um, blocking. It's a global statistic. Is it is that something you can observe on a system to sure you could or... RC you could get the time, RC read lock, RC read lock, get the time. Sorry, like is it already like in a file somewhere or no? Uh the, that would be overhead. <laughs> Sure. So if I'm deciding whether to use RCU for a case, I should measure it on my system and then... Yeah, one easy way to do that, um, uh, make a preemptible kernel, all right? And then you'll have, as non-inline functions, an underbar under our RCU read lock and an underbar under our RCU read unlock. And you can make a pretty simple um, a BPF program. Attach into both, both of them and, you know, just do the usual thing where you throw in a map based on the thread and just, you know... Uh, yeah. Take the duration. You have to be a little careful if there's nesting, uh, but you should be able to do that by just having a counter on the map as well. Is a non-preemptible? A preemptible kernel. Preemptible. A non-preemptible kernel. It's inline. <laughs> you can't see them, <laughs> and BPF can't attach to them. Um, 
No, so well, or you could use tracing for that matter, or, you know, or you could do it manually with per CPU variables. If you have an embedded system, that's going to be easier than trying to make PPF work on your system. But you know, whatever works. But yeah, yeah, check it out. See what's see what's going on. Okay, so these are a bunch of use cases. I'm not going to dwell on these again. Uh, there's some presentations that go through these, how you use RCU in different ways. Uh, RCU is mostly described as kind of like a reader writer lock because that's mostly, that's the use case that's the most popular. Maybe it's most popular because it's most described, or maybe it's most described and most popular, maybe both, I don't know. But uh, it's possible to do a bunch of other things with it. The phase state change is uh, actually closest to the raw use of RCU. Okay, so uh, we already talked about flavor consolidation, so I'm gonna skip that. Eventually, uh, this is a backporting thing. Okay, so Joel Fernandez, uh, what used to happen is there's list for each entry RCU, and it only it only paid attention to RC readers. All right, I mean you had to have RC read locker locked up at yell at you. Joel Fernandez added an optional additional member to these guys, and if you put a lock depth condition there, you can say it, it'll decide. Okay, um, you can either be in an RC reader or you can hold this lock. And of course, you make the condition as complicated as you want. Hold this lock, or it's Tuesday, or you know, whatever. Uh, uh, do what you want, but <laughs> you get to debug it. So you know, please let that <laughs> guide your your creativity. And uh, locked up is held at the ampersand event mutex would be an example condition you could put in there. So uh, that makes it a little bit easier to use and a little bit nicer. You don't have these stupid extra RC read lock, RC unlocks. His only purpose is to shut lock depth up. <laughs> Okay, uh, Vlad uh, Retsky did a single argument about uh, uh, KV-free. Now, the classic way of doing it, which still works, is you do KV-free of a uh, pointer and you give the field. So you have a field named RH in the, in the structure, and that had to be an RCU head. And it would turn that into a call RCU for you. The advantage of this is it's kind of fire and forget. You, you do K-free RCU, and it would just go free at whenever, and you didn't have to worry about it again. It wasn't like you had to have a callback function that was there. It was nice for modules. One of the hassles with modules is that you use a call RCU, and then somebody unloads the module. Well, you got to do an RCU barrier to make sure that all the callbacks get done, because otherwise uh, your module unloaded and the callback doesn't exist, function doesn't exist anymore, and bad things happen really quickly. All right. So things like K3RCU, if all you're doing is K3ing it, it uh, makes things a lot easier. But what you can do now, and the problem with that was that uh, you had to have this extra pair of pointers in your structure, because an RCU head is, is a function pointer and an X pointer. Uh, and a lot of times that's not a big deal, but there are some small structures that are really high in count, and that was a problem. They, they couldn't tolerate the size. So the new way, you just give the pointer without the field. Now, um, there's no free lunch. If you do that, it might sleep. And the reason it might sleep is because if you're out of memory, it can't do anything, right? It, it doesn't, it has to, what it does earlier is allocate a page and it has a page of pointers and just plugs a pointer to this thing into that page. And when the page fills up, it hands the whole mess off to RCU and then gets back and K-frees the pointers. But if there's no partially filled page, it has to allocate one. If the allocation fails, well, what it does is it calls synchronize RCU which you can do no matter how short, how short memory is. And that means you wait for a full grace period when that thing happens, all right? So it could sleep, but it probably won't unless you're out of memory, almost never will. And uh, you don't need that extra uh, on a 64 byte system, 16 bytes in each of your data structures. And uh, uh, this uses K3 bulk, uh, which means that you just, it just does a call and just goes scanning through these pointers. It actually, uh, where you use it heavily, it can give a few percentage points in performance increase. The reason is, uh, what happens in the old way is you have a, an object that you k free and then it has a pointer to the next one and a pointer to the next one. And when you come to, to invoke those, to k free those, as a cache buster. You know, you have to get these widely separated pointers you're loading. And the CPU can't really do much about that. Uh, so you end up with cache misses. Uh, if you have the page of pointers, then 
all those things are right there and, and the and the prefetching works wonderfully and you just go through and, and go at full speed once you take the you take cash miss every cash line. So you take cash miss only every uh, what, you know, 16, 8, 32 pointers, depending on your cash line size. So that's been around for a while. Um, I'm not going to go into detail on these. Uh, if you're into tracing or BPF, these are important. Uh, the big thing is uh, that if you're using RCU task trace, um, don't just read the documentation. Talk to me and talk to the BPF guys because it's kind of special for them. And if you go around and uh, put readers in there, they're doing things they don't expect to cause problems. All right. But if it shows up in your stack trace, you know what it's doing. It's a, essentially it's a it's a variant of SRCU that um, uh, uh, has very low read site overhead is what you can think of it. Okay, and that just kind of goes through how they, the names of them, so you can see that, and if one of those shows up, you'll know what you're doing and dealing with. Okay, I'll talk a little bit more about this stuff. Um, one of the things that uh, can happen a lot is you've got this thing you want to get rid of, but you've got a bunch of other stuff to do. And there's been some stuff that's like uh, 3.14, where you can say, get state synchronized RCU. You can take the thing it returns you, tag it into the object, and then you go do some other stuff. And you can go come back to this object that you removed, and you can call con, you, you can call con synchronize RCU, pass it the thing that get state synchronized gave back to you. So get state synchronized RCU gave you a cookie. You pass that cookie to con synchronize RCU. And it'll either immediately return if a grace period elapsed while you were doing stuff, or it'll wait for a grace period. Okay, so if you have a situation where removing stuff and you do some heavy duty long operations that might involve networking or file system active or whatever, file system back and rotating disk days, I was 3.14 after all, um, you may just be able to free it immediately. Um, now, there but later have been some people that uh, don't want to wait. I mean, uh, they want to know whether they can free it immediately, but they don't want to have something go and block. They've got a thread that needs to, has other stuff to do all the time. And so uh, there's uh, start pull synchronized RCU is like get state R synchronized RCU, but it guarantees the grace phrase will be started to service the request. Get state synchronized RCU just gives you a cookie, and it's up to you to make sure the grace periods are up to somebody to make sure grace periods happen. It doesn't care. It just gave you a cookie. If nobody has any grace periods, the cookie will never expire. Uh, start pull synchronize RCU, make sure you have at least one uh, grace period that's going to happen. Uh, pull state synchron synchronized RCU is kind of like con synchronized RCU. You give it a cookie you got from one of those two start pull or get state functions, but all it does is return true or false. It returns true if there's a grace period elapsed since you got the cookie, or false if it hasn't. Um, and then uh, uh, in five in uh, five twenty, I guess it turned out to be six six zero. We've got get completed synchronized RCU, and that gives you back an expired cookie. I mean, it's a cookie that that uh, pull state synchronized RCU will immediately say nope, uh, yes, it all, it got done, and con state synchronized RCU will just return immediately. Uh, what's the point of that, right? Well, the point of that is you've got something where uh, these things are counters and they can overflow, especially on thirty two bit systems. And uh, what that means is if you ever see con state uh, excuse me, uh, pull state synchronized RCU tell you true, you can grab something, get completed synchronized RCU, and, and plop that into place so that if you're scanning a list repeatedly, uh, every time you come later, it'll show that it's still ready to be immediately dealt with. And we'll have a slight later. I mean, why would you need that? Well, if we got a slight later, we'll show a possible use case. Okay, and then we have expedited versions of uh, start pull and con synchronized RCU. Uh, there were some people that wanted to have it happen faster. And then somebody wanted it for SRCU, so we have those three as well there. Um, nobody want, nobody asked for a consynchronized uh, SRCU, so I didn't make one. If somebody wants one, it's easy to make, but it's also easy to to uh, make out of the existing primitives. Okay, so here is how you might use that. So we do uh, uh, we do up there. We get our cookie from get state synchronized RCU. We go do something, whatever it is. We get back, we call consynchronized RCU, maybe we call the expedited version, maybe we don't, that's a choice, and we pass the cookie in. And when we get done, 
a grace period will have elapsed, either because it already elapsed and it just returned, or because it waited for the grace period for us. Okay, so that's kind of the use case for that. And here's how you might use these things. Uh, so you might have a, so on the, on the far left there, we have the cookie in red. Readers have access to that. That's why it's red. Okay, so they, they're coming in, they're doing stuff. At some point, we may say, well, you know, this thing's been in there for a while. Maybe we've got like, like a cache of stuff that we're, we're maintaining. And we say this thing's been there for a while, has been used for a while, so let's uh, try to stage it for removal. So we move it to the second thing with a, uh, with a cookie there. So we do list s up del rcu to remove it. We do either get state synchronize rcu or the start pull, one of the start pull things, and we plug the cookie with the return value. Okay. So then later on, uh, we can do pull state synchronize rcu and see if it's ready to be, to be free. Now, at the same time, somebody might have said, wait a minute, I need this now, and they might remove it back into the list, all right? Uh, so you have to presumably have locking or whatever to make that all synchronized and work out. But uh, that's why we're doing it this way. We don't just do a call RCU or a synchronizer and just free it unconditionally because, you know, we might have been wrong. So we might need it immediately, and it gets moved back. And so no harm done. We just got this cookie that's now pointless, and life is good. Now, uh, at some point, we say, okay, this hasn't been used. It's grace-free. It's expired, so let's get rid of it. Um, in that case, we can use get completed RCU, or get completed synchronized RCU if we want to just make sure the cookie stays expired, even though we want to immunize ourselves to counter wrap, or we just say forget it, we're going to free it, we're done. Okay, but this allows a state machine like approach so that you never block and you don't have these callbacks hanging out you have to worry about. You just manage the whole thing yourself uh, with your own state machine. Okay, um, there's a caveat with this. The thing is we have both normal and expedited grace periods and they run independently. I tried to make them together and it just turned into a mess every time I did it. So I said, fine, they're, they're, uh, they're independent and this is kind of paying the price. The thing is that either an expedited or a normal grace period will take care of us, but we need to have a single counter for this API. That's part of the point is that you only have one unsigned longs worth of state you're carrying. And there are races where the expedited and, and uh, normal grace periods overlap, where we have to miss one or the other of them. Okay, the the, the single counter we're using for the for the polling uh, can't perfectly reflect the overlapping grace periods. We we need two counters to do that. So there's only one counter, and we can miss grace periods. So you could have something like this: get state synchronized RCU. You could do a, a, a grace period. And this warn on once could happen for two reasons. One is that this grace period may have overlapped funny with some other grace periods such that we lost the count. Okay, we can only count full grace periods. If we have three overlapping ones, we, we can't count three because we'll give somebody a too short grace period. So we can only count two of them. And that means one of them gets lost. The other reason we can lose is because we might have wrapped the counter. So what you can do, and this is what RCU torture does, is you can just do two grace periods. That way, some grace period is guaranteed to have won there somewhere, and it's guaranteed to get done. But if this is, and the thing is, a lot of times, for a lot of these things, if you end up waiting for an expedited grace period, a normal grace period, those only overlap, that's not a big deal. But sometimes you care. If you do care, your other alternative is to use more storage, okay? And uh, what we have is we have a structure that has both counters in it. And that way we get both the expedited and the normal counter. That's more space, but it's the same space that an RCU had, okay? So it's the same space you'd use in many other cases. If that space is a problem, you can use, you know, you have a, a time space trade out you can make. And so you have the same set of, um, of APIs with underbar full after them. And these uh, probably get in six or two, I think. And the, the thing is, for all of these things, there's a limit to the number of uh, unique counter values that can be unsatisfied, right? And uh, so we, in other words, if you call get state synchronized RCU and it gives you a counter, and then you call again and keep calling to you to get a different, different counter, um, and you keep calling you get a third and a fourth counter, what you're guaranteed is there's a, ma there's a maximum number of those that correspond to grace periods that have not yet elapsed. Um, so, for example, 
um, if you let's just pretend you're only doing normal grace periods just to avoid the the loss and to keep things straightforward. In that case, so you can have two values that haven't completed yet. You get one value and and it hasn't completed yet, but it starts. And then you say get state synchronized RC. Well, you can't wait till the grace period has already started. So you have to have a different value, right? So you got two values. Now, what you keep calling get state synchronized RCU, well, the only way it can advance new value is this grace period completes. You'll get another value, but this one is expired. So in this situation, you'd have at most two counter values that correspond to grace periods that haven't expired. And that's what this non active RCU fold state value gives you. So for example, if you want, if you if you had a thing like we had those boxes on the previous slide. And you wanted to just have have lists of things. You, you said, I don't, I want full, but I don't want to put this stupid thing in every stupid data structure. A way to get around that would be have array an array of that size and just tag the structures, hang the structures off the array, assuming you have a pointer to do that with, which you normally do. And then all you have to do is uh, say, okay, get state synchronized RCU. Does that correspond to one of the ones I already have? Yes, it does. Great. Throw it on the end of that list. Um, no, I need another one. Okay, uh, let's check to see if the oldest one I have is already expired. Has it? Uh, no. Okay, well, go to another array element and plop the value in there and start doing that list. Whoops, I'm out of array elements. Well, at that point, you know that the oldest one has to be expired. Um, and you can take care of those and then uh, keep going around the array. Does that make sense? And then uh, for the full uh, situation, you've got both grace period counters involved. So you can have more elements, you get more combinations because you have both grace periods that started um, and then you get new counters for both of them. So you end up with four instead of two, but there you are. Anyway, so that's uh, something that, uh, and the other thing that I failed to mention, get state synchronized RCU and uh, full state synchronized RCU do not block. In fact, they don't acquire locks. If you need to, you can, use them you can call them with an nmi handlers okay i'm not sure that any would be managing caches and nmi handlers but if you are we're here for you and so if you do the full thing and i managed to forget to put full on the top one i apologize uh, but if you do the full thing then you do a single one and uh, now this can still trigger but it's going to trigger via counter wrap and if you're on a 64-bit system that's one good long wait because it takes a long time for a 64 bit counter to overflow. So, 64 bit system essentially is, for all practical purposes, cannot happen. On a 32 bit system, maybe it could. Uh, the case where it could happen on a 32 bit system would be if you only had one CPU, in which case, grace periods can be amazingly fast. And then you could cycle through them quickly enough that you could end up with this problem. Okay. Um, at this point, uh, I'll stop. Pause for a bit. Uh, we do have a question, so go. So how, how do you avoid the problem with the wrapping around for 32 bit uh, It happened. It can happen. I mean, I'm sorry, but um, uh, one way to avoid it would be to never run on a single CPU system. Um, uh, you'd also have to make sure you're on a, uh, you didn't offline all but one of the CPUs at that point, uh, because at that point your grace periods take tens of microseconds, and then uh, and then to to um, it actually you actually have to run through almost 4 billion. So what uh, 4 billion uh, divided by 100,000 uh, is about 40,000 seconds, which is, I mean, at that point, if you are if you have that long of a delay, uh, something's gonna have noticed, right? Um, uh, you know, 40,000 seconds is, what is that? Uh, that's about 10 hours. So you still could run into it. It's not that long, no, it's not that long. But on the other hand, if you're, I mean, at that point, you can, if you're worried about it, you can do things like put time checks in. And the thing is, is that you, it's, it all, it checks, it checks for the values. It's not one of these things where, where half of the sequence space is undone and the other half is done. It's like a few values are done. So um, you're not going to wait that much longer. You waited 10 hours. You're only going to wait a few longer. Uh, so the only time you're going to get hit with extra grace periods, you've already gone through four billion of them. All right. <laughs> so at that point, why do you care again? 
Maybe somebody does, but they'll have to explain it to me. Maybe in, in the way things work, somebody eventually will, but they'll have, they have to actually do it. I'm sorry. Okay, um, and then the runtime deoploading. Uh, uh, if you attended uh, Joel and uh, a vlog and uh, Adam's uh, presentations either just before break or yesterday, uh, they use they, what happens is that instead of as, as we talked discussed earlier, instead of uh, invoking the RCU callbacks in soft IRQ, you hand them off to another thread. Um, what you have to do now. Um, from as a user and administrator, is you have to decide at boot time which CPUs are going to be offloaded and which not. Um, a lot of uh, Android and Chrome OS just offload all of them, so that's easy. But uh, there have been people that have been increasingly want wanting to uh, do the offloading for real time response reasons, as opposed to for power saving reasons. And at that point, uh, the problem is the systems have gotten large. And so they know that the real-time piece only needs eight CPUs and they got 90 other CPUs or maybe only 88. And then uh, they wanna use those for something more throughput oriented that might not like the overhead of handing these things off to some other K thread. Um, and they might find though that uh, they need to reprovision this thing and they don't wanna reboot, which they currently have to do in order to say, no, the real-time thing doesn't need um, eight CPUs and needs 16 now, or I'm gonna put an extra few real-times on here. So I need to, move the CPUs around. And so the in-kernel infrastructure to handle this is in place. And uh, RC torture tests it. Uh, the next step is to plumb it out to user space. And the idea is you, you take a CPU and you just change its state, and it takes some time uh, for that to happen. Uh, it, has to, it has to go through and uh, uh, it, it's a bit of a dance. You can't ever be in a situation where you're not executing call tax, okay? And so that means there's a period of time where the callbacks are both being executed by the CPU and by the thread. And then there's some, uh, RCU has some uh, interesting restrictions it has to obey to make that work. Okay. So it takes some time, but allows you to dynamically reprovision your system to change the CPUs in real time versus not in that situation. Um, the reason we don't have it out to user space is that they also want no hertz full to work the same way. What no hertz full does uh, is it makes your, so if you only have one runnable user space task on a system, that user space task monopolizes that CPU. There aren't even scheduling lock interrupts. Um, and they've got it so it's fairly well automated. Back in 2010, you had to do a whole bunch of stuff manually, get this interrupt and that interrupt and this other thing pushed off of it. But they've got things fairly closely well now where um, you just designate which CPUs you want to be isolated and, and stuff gets pushed off for you. But again, um, people want to reprovision. This is used not just for real time. Uh, it, it allows you to have a real time polling loop style thing, the stuff you normally had to do in deep embedded. Well, nor it's full, you can do this just on a CPU with a full length kernel right there if you need it. Um, but you just pull it, the CPU is mine, thank you. And uh, RCU just ignores it as long as you're in user space and, and uh, you offload the callbacks. So if you do do a system call, and their callbacks, they happen somewhere else and they don't interfere with you, but on the system call you did to yourself. Um, and the no horse full is not yet dynamic. I'm probably causing camera problems with people online. Hopefully I didn't make them too seasick. Um, so it's, so uh, I believe that he's gonna get that taken care of. And then once he gets that, then plumb the whole mess out of user space. Uh, but who knows, maybe somebody wants uh, the, well, somebody badly enough wants the, uh, offloading to be plumbed uh, that they'll submit some patches to Frederick and uh, maybe he'll like them. Inside, it's, if you're doing something, if you if you have something inside the kernel, there's some functions you call do it yourself in the kernel, but the, that's not plumbed to user space yet. So it would not be hard to plumb the user space. Me, I'm RCU torture is my only use of them, so I'm not motivated to, but they're there. Um, FreeSRCU had really big, the problem is the distros want to have one binary for all their systems. So if you have a nice uh, 32 CPU system, you got a kernel that's capable of running 4,096 CPUs, or maybe it's only uh, 1960 or what, right? But it's a lot of CPUs. And SRCU is set up uh, to take care of lots of CPUs and it's allocated to compile time. 
And that means your SRC struct is provisioned for 2048 CPUs or whatever you sort of decided was its maximum limit. And it's big, okay? Uh, that turned out to be a problem. Um, I offered to make this change several times and people, what happens, people were finding other ways to work around it because they didn't want to wait for me to get the job done. And eventually I figured out that was what was happening. It's like, oh, they went away, maybe they didn't care. Well, no, they cared, but they figured out they could move this field past this field and put the SRC structure in the structure or do some other silly thing. It's like, this is stupid. So I uh, went in and, and made it so that um, for dynamically allocated SRC structs, they're sized based on what the system actually has. So based on the CPU possible mask, as opposed to, excuse me, the CPU, not possible mask, uh, not CPU online mask, CPU possible mask, as opposed to all the CPUs that might exist anywhere. Um, and uh, so this is this is in there. Um, it actually can work dynamically if you want. Um, you you can shrink it down. You can run it in small mode. Uh, we eventually decided to uh, uh, make it decide at boot time as opposed to a runtime. The reason for what deciding at runtime is that most SRC structs don't care. I mean, they're used so infrequently that it's just okay to not have a tree. And for those guys, why well, have a tree? Uh, but um, I don't yet trust the runtime uh, expansion code. So it's there. If you want to, if you want to help debug it, great. Uh, there's a boot parameter you can set that'll do that. And please send me your bug reports. I'll fix them. But I'm not going to uh, visit this on unwary users. Okay, <laughs> you have to opt in. So right now, what'll happen is it'll it'll uh, size them at boot time for the size of your system. If you, that's too much memory for you, you want to shrink it down, or you just want to help me do testing. I mean, RC Torture does expand and contract them at runtime uh, to make sure that it uh, that I catch the bugs. But uh, you can also uh, set zero uh, x one three on the uh, SRC SRCU uh, convert to big boot parameter. All right, so we covered that, and uh, uh, Niraj helped me a lot with this, uh, get it, getting it uh, stuck together. Uh, Real-time expedited grace periods, we discussed those already. Um, this was a total surprise to me earlier this year. I mean, uh, I mean, I've done real-time, but I didn't expect anybody to need, to need a grace period to be real-time, okay? And in my mind, grace periods are kind of the antithesis of real-time, but here I am. So, you know, a little excitement. We talked about that. That wasn't quite what I had in mind. Okay. Um, uh, one thing I'm just reminding people because I still hear people come across this, they think that uh, RC readers can't be preempted. They can if you have a preemptible kernel. So please don't forget that. Um, there used to be there were some weird restrictions on the scheduler use of RC read unlock to prevent deadlocks between RC and the, and the scheduler. Something about the scheduler using RCU and RCU relying on the schedule to run its k-threads. Um, and uh, Lai Jiangshan came up with a clever way to fix that based on the flavor consolidation. So that was really cool. Now they can just, if, if uh, the scheduler wants to do RC read lock uh, with interrupts enabled and then wants to acquire one of the scheduler locks, disable interrupts and wants to call RC read, RC read unlock, it'll work, okay? Unlike previously or deadlock. Uh, uh, RC used to ignore much of the idle loop, and that was a real pain for tracing. And um, the idle, I mean, you know, I remember back in the day when an idle loop was like a, 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 a just a while loop with nothing in it. And good lord, <laughs> you know, take a look at that thing. It's got all sorts of stuff in it. Something about uh, uh, wanting to save energy and uh, CPUs having power states and the Linux kernel selecting what to do next. Um, and so the old uh, tradition of RC ignores the entire idle loop uh, became kind of problematic. Uh, Peter and Thomas uh, made it so that the part RC is not watching is really the inner core part. It may have to shrink further in the future, but uh, the parts of the idle loop that are doing actual work now are visible to RC by default. Frederick Weisbecker merged uh, contact tracking in RC dynamic idle. I believe that's in uh, 6.0, but I have to look. And uh, uh, the special BPF uh, RC grace periods are now faster. Uh, Google ran into some situations where uh, it was chewing up. 53 milliseconds scanning the task list, so we so I 
forked it over to make it so it doesn't have to do that. Anyway, um, at this point, we're pretty much at the end. I'll take a final question. Uh, the main thing about the future, you've already seen uh, some people are getting interested in RCU internals, and that's a good thing. There's several people. You've seen their names on the slides. Um, well, the story I tell, I know a guy who, uh, and some of you heard this. I apologize for repeating it. I know a guy who, uh, uh, at age, he, he retired at age 89. Uh, he was running a machine shop, uh, doing work for Boeing, contract work for Boeing. He did the last few years, maybe a decade, he worked half time. Uh, he took Mother Nature's retirement program. Another guy was doing limited consulting work into his early 90s, very early 90s, uh, mostly uh, servicing radiation therapy machinery. Uh, I know a woman who was doing city planning work, small cities, but still city planning work into her 70s. Another guy who was uh, running a dairy farm to age 80. And there's a guy, uh, uh, when I get back, I'll arrange a lunch with him. He turned 90 uh, this past January. He cut back to four days a week a few years ago, although if he was here, you'd argue that he actually only works two days a week. But at his age, it takes four days to get the work done. <laughs> Those are my two grandfathers, my, one of my grandmothers, my father-in-law, and my father. So if I follow their example, I'll be around for a while. But passing bus could decide otherwise at any time. And if you believe the uh, United States of America Social Security Administration statistics, I've got about a 98.5% chance of still being around this time next year. Which for a guy my age, especially in historical context, is pretty damn good, actually. But as a single point of failure in the Linux kernel community, it sucks. So, um, you know, if you run into the guys whose names are there, please thank them for me and encourage them. Because in some sense, RCU is normally isn't the most problematic thing. I mean, um, you know, I, uh, I'm in the way of print K right now because they expected SR3 to be me in my safe. That's not a hard change to make, but I'll make it, okay? But um, it's not something where um, where people are willing to invest a huge amount into it because it mostly does what it needs to. But still, we need people to understand it. So, you know, again, I expect to be around and uh, I don't know how long I'll be able to deal with RCU. I mean, you know, maybe a year, maybe a day, maybe 10 years, maybe, maybe 30. I don't know. But um, at some point I won't. And we need somebody to be around who can at that point, whenever that is. So again, uh, please encourage these people. And uh, and uh, Bushun is actually one who's done Linux kernel, uh, learning from memory models, same sort of thing. So, uh, and uh, to the extent possible, also encourage our employers to continue investing in this. The employer isn't really getting any return. The return is going to the community as a whole, but somebody's got to do it, right? So anyway, thank you for your time and attention. Hopefully this uh, got you some ideas for future use or kept you out of trouble in some way or another, or at least entertained you for an hour and a half. Uh, and uh, have a great rest of the conference. And again, thank you. Thank you. Cheers. How old are you? Don't look at Dave past uh, the uh, the, the th story I told the LSFMM is, you know, in a, what is it? Yeah, in a, about a month and a half, I turn 100. 100? Base what? 8. <laughs> <laughs> For you guys that are doing these newfangled 8 bit bytes, that'd be 40. <laughs>
I had a moderately ridiculous question. Sure, I probably got a moderate and ridiculous answer to go with it. Yeah, it is probably too dumb to ask in front of everyone. Yeah. But I, I was just curious. Um, I, I can make I can make an answer that'll make you look good. <laughs> sure, I'm sure you could. Uh, so, is RCU synchronized really required? And um, like no. for instance, could you Actually. theoretically do the cleanup in the lab? Um. Uh. Yes, but I guess was the right thing. Let's see. So. And and, and if so, is it mm -hmm. really practical? I guess. Uh. Okay. So let me. Uh. There's a whole. There, actually, that's a good question. And there's a. It's got a big, a design space. Let's see here. What do I do? I go here and I say I want to leave the meeting. One of these here. Is it this one? Yes, it's this one. Thanks. Thanks, everybody online. Leave meeting.